Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Sure, we have 30 seconds to tell you that drivers who switch to Progressive could save big. But then what? Well, radio has been called theater of the mind, so let's tell a story with sound effects. <laughs> Wow, it's like I was in the story. Almost makes me forget this was supposed to be about saving big with Progressive. <laughs> Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Welcome to another BritFleet.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is filmmaker and comedian Graham Fellows. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Stuart. Very nice to be here. People may know you better, as I certainly did, because I, I remember seeing you at Bloomsbury Theatre a while ago, as John Shuttleworth, a comedy character, who has uh, was done you well for, for a number of years. Um, and he features in your new film, Father Earth, uh, alongside you and your, and your family. Um, now, before we get into any details about making it, do, do you want to give like a brief synopsis, a brief synopsis, a brief summary of what Father Earth is, the documentary you've made? I think a summary might be easier than a synopsis. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Well, this, it's basically um, my attempt uh, to document my life, really, in two periods, 2010 and 2020. Um, the reasons for that will, I'm sure, explain uh, shortly. But I, I basically filmed on <clears throat> an iPhone, uh, latterly, but originally it was a flip uh, digital camera that were quite popular back then. Mm. And also uh, some Sony Z5 footage with various people. And um, so I was really, I guess that the, the basic premise was me trying to, drive an electric car from London up to Orkney, where I have, uh, well, at the time it was a completely dilapidated church. And it was to document that journey, which didn't happen in the end. I'm not really spoiling the plot too much <clears throat> by saying that. But lots of other things happened, including a trip with my dad. Uh, and that, I think, is probably the, the most exciting bit in the film. Um, it's all about the detail, as as most of my work is. Environmental issues are, are touched upon and discussed, and it's up to the viewer to conclude uh, how well I deal with environmental issues. I mean, again, it's not a spoiler to say it's about man's struggle, really, to focus on saving the world, dealing with eco matters when they're faced with their own personal problems. It's an interesting part of the film that, that, in many ways, trying to save the world becomes like a bloody inconvenience, not not something that should just fall into place. I think that's right. I think that's what it is. It is an inconvenience to people. Um, we don't really want to be worrying about having to go on marches and <clears throat> lobbying the government to change their policies on CO2 capture, etc., well, I think what we fail to realize is that we're all involved in this and, and the quality of our lives is completely connected to the quality of the state of the world and the, the air and 
the future of um, the ice caps. You know, it's but we just we're, like politicians tend to be. We're quite short short termist. Mm. We don't really see far into the future. We we can't. We think about the here and now. And I think this is what allows politicians to get away with dreadful short-term policy making because they think, well, I'm only going to be in power for two or three years. I want to do things that are going to be popular now. And this is where I think the public needs needs to shift. It's uh, They have to think about their children's future. And that's something that I touch upon in the film because my son, George, is also a character in the film because I don't, I'm not seeing a lot of him due to a... a, a split up with his mum uh, which is all sort of inf- implied it's not really touched upon too deeply mm. but towards the end you see me with my son and we're up in Orkney enjoying ourselves so and there's some great music in it um, I that's one of the, the joys of making your own film you can sort of ferret around for music that you like the sound of and I've always liked a song called Take Time by Lorraine Bowen who's known as a comedy songwriter but this is just like one of her really sensitive heartfelt ballads that's just about saying take time to enjoy looking at the fish in the water well what fish yeah but watch enjoy looking at the birds just take time to listen to the music of mother earth indeed no uh, apple crumble song is 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 a very big favorite of mine absolutely yeah most people know for the uh, everybody's good at cooking crumble um, and I've worked with her at John Shuttleworth shows over the years, but I've always thought, hey, that song, did, you know, little known song deserves another airing. I'm also a big fan of Chris Wood, the very English folk singer, and a song of his called Strange Cadence I was on his an album a few years ago when I was putting it together, and uh, it's just about how a, a lark is singing a very strange cadence and he's basically telling man to watch out because the sun's going to eat us all up and we don't. No. I hope we will. I hope there's a bit of optimism in, in the film but um, it's a kind of a warning but it's also a, a gentle tale of, of uh, family relationships and, and also I don't know if you picked this up but the interaction between me and John Shuttleworth, mainly in dressing room mirrors at theatres, is is a very intriguing part of the film. Well, as well. we'll get to, I'll get to that because I want to talk. I want to talk how, how, you, how you kind of write that kind of thing. But 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 with a film that spans twelve years and that starts off with with sort of almost like like as a as a road movie with you and your father going up to the the wilds of of Orkney to your, your derelict church where you begin in your construction and your studio and then concludes with. A sort of less less of a road movie, more of a like you and your son at the location, sort of enjoying each other's company. Where, I mean, you don't. I find it, it, it it's it felt very personal and not and not linked to the bigger the, the, where you started the message, which is this this gee whiz car you wanted to 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 take up to you know as part of saving the world. You can get this electric car up to Orkney. Um, mm. What in in terms of your sort of thinking about making a film, I mean. Were, were your thoughts in 2010 what you were what you were planning to do in 2020 or was 2020 a reaction to what you'd already done? Uh, the latter, yes. I mean, I abandoned the film in 2011 right. after the Sutton and Sweet footage. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're my guest stars. You've got to have some big guest names in any film <laughs> and Sutton and Sweet are my, my big guest stars. Um, because John Shuttleworth gets a, a role in, in Such and Sweet. He does. A very brilliant TV series. Series. Yeah. Yeah, and I love doing that. And they very kindly let us film the filming process. So I did do a cut back then. And uh, sadly, um, again, possible spoiler, but my father was getting very elderly and he did pass away. I couldn't really face looking at the footage, you know, to, to edit it. Um, oh, okay. uh, to finish off the film so I kind of put it on the back burner got on with other things I've always been very busy with you know the next John Shuttleworth tour or a radio series and then come 2020 um, I'd moved to Leicester and um, this local filmmaker happened to contact me and say listen uh, you're doing a gig in the local theatre can I come and film 
film a bit of it and film you, you know, setting up or whatever. So I said, yes, not really thinking about my project from 2010. And suddenly as we were filming, I found myself talking to John Shuttleworth in the mirror, as I had done in the past. And he shot the gig. And I thought, blimey, I could connect this to the earlier footage and, you know, resurrect that, uh, resurrect the film, Father Earth. And then lockdown came, which was a lovely dramatic twist uh, in terms of um, the film. (laughs) And that went in as well. And then, so it's a combination of of event, organic events, real life events that that shape the film. Mm. And me just making a decision about how I should harness those that's how. That's what's made the film, and I, that, hopefully, that's like any good documentary, really. Um, well, I guess it's, you know, documentaries can take many forms. You can just, you know, what the event is, and you film it, and it's about that event. I didn't know what the events would be, and I just documented them as they went along. And then the real task was putting them all together, and making. Yeah, a, yeah. I mean, I mean, just before we film. get onto that, like obviously, I joked, joked, you know, sort of tongue in cheek about the, the sort of inconvenience of, of. Um, of trying to save the world. But one thing that, that is more convenient as a documentary filmmaker, and you talked about the flip phone and the iPhone, is the ability to ke- get footage now has sort of changed from, if you go back 10 years before you even started the stuff with your father, you know, you'd have mm. had to be lugging a camera around of some description. Um, That's it. Not a flip yeah. phone you could put in your back pocket. Um, mm. how, 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 has that, how has that technology liberated you as a filmmaker? Oh, Totally. Totally. I mean, the, perhaps the last 15 minutes of the film, most of them are, are shot on my iPhone. Mm. And it looks fantastic. You know, uh, the picture's fantastic. It's just, um, it's better than the, the posh camera from 2010. <laughs> and the next version is the iPhone 14. I'm looking at um, possibly getting for my next project, whatever that is. That's going to be even better. So, yeah, it's, it's liberated filmmaking um there's still a lot of snobbery about uh, the right sort of cameras you should be using but i just what i like about the film is that it is shot on various cameras and you don't really notice it do you i mean you just accept well you kind of you kind of know you kind of get the sense because obviously you show mm. us you with them in your hand for starters so it's hard not to it's hard not to picture it in your hand even when we can't see it but, but yeah but in that sense, Graham, it, it it lends the film a kind of personable touch. It's like there's you're not you're trying to keep as little distance between the subject and the audience as you possibly can. And us and us being familiar with the iPhone means that you know we we'll, we'll, we when we're playing silly buggers or whatever, you know, we'll we'll mm. <clears throat> we'll we'll film ourselves on the phone. I mean, I only yesterday I I donned a woolly hat and stuffed it with stuff and sung Happy Birthday to my nephew who lives over in Portland, USA, <laughs> and we sent the video now. That wasn't something that 15, 20 years ago you could have just done a drop of a drop of a hat. And now now you do it. You don't, you don't even think you're making a film. You're just sending a birthday message to me, nephew. You know, that's kind of mm. and I feel like yeah, that, a, that kind of personal touch is what we get we get big, big style in your film. Yeah, I think the difficulty though that arises is that suddenly you have a lot more footage. So, you know, you have to be a lot more ruthless about. Uh, what you put in and uh, you've got a lot more to look at before you make a decision. So it's, that's the hard work. I mean, I must have shot a hundred hours okay. of this. And uh, so you have to develop a sort of keen sense of what is potentially a, a good shot and reject uh, the rubbish quite early on. In the old days when you had to shoot on film, obviously you had far less rushes and uh, the decision making about what you use was a bit easier but no it is a good thing and uh, yeah it, I find myself thinking about documentaries I don't think I want to make uh, dramas really I mean my my, my history as an actor uh, that I went to drama school in Manchester in the late 70s and went into TV drama and, and, and local rep theatre but I did a lot of TV and it was all dramas and uh, I enjoyed that but I think it's a lot harder really uh, to organise and uh, I don't know 
I've I've kind of stopped seeing myself as an actor. I'm um, a songwriter first, I would say. Now possibly a filmmaker second, but well, and a comedian mm. of sorts. But that's blame John Shuttleworth. <laughs> that was meant to be just a little joke that I started in in eighty five to um, fool a publisher friend, and became my living for thirty years plus. And 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 in a way, he's 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 it's even though he's 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 imagined, and obviously he's real when we see you dressed as him. He's he's like part of your family, isn't he? In the in the way that the film, the film sort of documents mm. what's going on. Yeah, I mean, there's supposed to be a a, a thing like a, a parallel going on the relationship between me and John, mm. John Shuttleworth, and me and my dad, and then me and my son. It's. Mm. You know, there's a, it, there's a, the film is, is about fathers and sons, and you could argue that John is the father to my son uh, when I'm talking to him in the mirror, though mm. that does sort of change towards the end and John becomes a bit more childlike and I become more adult. And um, So that parallel is meant to be there, but it's something I just started doing when I was touring in 2010. I really was fed up of the grind of, of touring and uh, it was I think I started to amuse myself but also you can see my very real frustration coming through at times can't you mm. yeah you you uh, you you capture the non-glamour of of the touring artist very well <laughs> if it's, if that's not an offensive yes. thing to say no no because it isn't glamorous and uh, you know yeah, it's it, it's very a lot of it is quite repetitive and going to horrible little theatres. I mean, did you like the theatre where there's a radiator poking up through the through the dressing room table? You can see. Yes. Yeah, no, it, it, it blows my mind. The 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 sort of I mean, I used to manage a rock band, and it's it's not quite it's not quite that level, but it's it's it is amazing how little the sort of talent gets for luxury. Compared to the, mm. then the performance you have to put on to entertain hundreds of people. Yeah, I mean, me, there's many a toilet I've had to get changed in <laughs> at the back of a pub in my <laughs> early days. Not so much now, but some of them can be quite pleasant. If it's not, if it's not too sensitive yeah. to talk about, um, given you did, you 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 couldn't face the footage of your father, and understandably when he passed away, how? how how much joy did you get from from re re looking back over it in the over the process of of pulling it together for the purposes of the film? Well, I did get joy because, and I get joy now watching the film because my dad's in it because enough time had passed from when he died, he died in twenty twelve. So mm. when I revisited the film in twenty twenty, it was like saying hello to an old friend, you know. And uh, it, it it wasn't upsetting. It was, um, and I lived with that footage. It probably took me six months to a year to pull it all together. And it's great. And and I've got three sisters and they love the film, but it's mainly because my dad's in it and, and they, you know, we get to see our dad when we watch the film. And uh, before he got... Sure, we have 30 seconds to tell you that drivers who switch to Progressive could save big. But then what? Well, there is a nice piece of stock music playing behind me that a talented composer worked really hard on. So let's enjoy it. Wow, almost overshadows the saving big when you switch to progressive part. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home 
at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. And that was, I think, at the back of my mind when I said, hey, let's go up to Orkney, Dad. Uh, I wanted to sort of capture his eccentricities on film. Hmm. Because sadly, my mum passed away when we were all quite young. I was only 28, and she died in in the 80s. And we didn't get much of her on film, and she's not really in the... There's one shot of her in the film. But, it, it, you know, so I think the film is about the passing of time as well, and you don't half get that with the gap of 10 years. Yeah, you yeah. You suddenly see me in 2010, and then you see me in 2020, and... Yes, God, I've aged, you know, but people do. You see, I mean, if it's not, again, if it's not too offensive, it's almost like in that 10 years, and especially given that the role is reversed, where you're the father and you're with your son, it's almost like mm. we've we've watched, we, we suddenly watched you grow up as well. And I think I'm not, I can't quite marry it up, but like what you were saying there before about your interactions with John Shuttleworth is... Is that marked by that same time then, where where you're you're more the father than you are the son later in life? Yeah, that's the point. I think I become I become um, the father. Well, I'm you know I slip into that role of when my son takes out my son takes out the kayak and I say, oh, be careful, don't go too far, and all that. Um, that's intentional. Um, well, you know, I wasn't saying it because I wanted. It's just that when you put it in the film, you see that's what's happened. Of course, and that's a good a good message for an audience to get. Uh, so, but it's it's about how to come back to the message of the film, if there is one. It's that people will care more about their immediate family than caring for Mother Nature and the Earth. But we have to realise that the two are linked, and you can't. There's no point in caring for. For your, for your family if the earth's about to blow up or burn up usually when I speak to documentary filmmakers they went out with a with a with a clear purpose as to what they were going to make a film about like we're going to investigate this and obviously yeah. because yours was broken up by the passage of time and life events it's not quite fit there so and usually the question I would ask someone is is sort of what what did you learn about something that you didn't perceive in the beginning but given this is so much about you is there, a way, is there a way of answering that question where it's like, how much did you learn about yourself that you didn't perceive about yourself in the beginning of the, of the process of making the film? Or is it about your understanding of something? <laughs> no, it's a quite a difficult question for me to answer, really. Well, you were, pulling the, you were pulling the narrative together, weren't you? So in a way, you're telling, a sto- you're telling us a story in the end off your 100 hours. So what were you, yeah. what were you learning yeah. about yourself that you didn't perceive? In that process, well, I was learning that a lot of the shots I don't like the way I look, uh, so um, and having to sort of swallow vanity about you know um, the way I come over. I, I think I remember when I was being filmed, um, I found it more, I found it easier to film myself because I'm used to doing that. Yeah. So any of the flip footage, I found a lot easier to just relax and be me, but. When I had a camera pointed at me, I found that harder because, you know, I'm an actor, so I'm thinking, well, who am I now? And that's been a, a problem for me quite a lot because I've spent a lot of my time acting. Yeah. At first, as a professional actor, and then I, I start doing John, and I become, you know, I'm very good at being John Shuttleworth. Mm. But to relax and be me in front of a camera is not quite so easy. So, but I've had to learn that because I, I you know, I've, when I started doing John Shortworth, I was at the point uh, I thought of getting a, a big record deal as myself. Um, you know, I'd had Jilted John in '78. Yeah, of course. Which again was was a character. You know, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I was trying. I was trying to be this sort of indie singer songwriter, um, and I, I got a publishing deal. And uh, had a record out called Love at the Hacienda, um, about the Hacienda nightclub. But I, um, so, so anyway, in 2018, I, I dropped John for a, a year or so, and I did a tour as myself in fairly small venues, art centres and small theatres, and just playing the guitar and the harmonium 
And that was a real learning curve, just being myself. Um, so I learned a lot from that. And I think by 2020, when it came to, be, to being filmed again, I was a little bit more relaxed in front of the camera than perhaps I was in 2010. But in terms of, to answer your question, I don't really know what I've learned. I've learned that uh, there's a lot of pleasure in sitting watching a film that you've made that actually looks like a real film. And, you know, the sound is the best sound I've ever had from any of my projects because I spent a bit of time and money on getting it done well by a professional. And I'd never heard of this DCP, the Digital Camera Pack. You probably know about those. Yeah. But that's how films are now delivered, you know. You, you have to get them processed in this very uh, large file, like over 150 gig, and then, and it's put on a drive, and that's how cinemas play them these days. Yeah. It's a far cry so, from, the, from, the, from the film reels. Yeah, and obviously a lot, ultimately a lot easier and less bulky. But I just, you know, I've had to learn about that. And uh, that's great. It's, it's, I think, but for me, the joys of, I've just started this tour where I'm going around about 35 places in the UK. Yeah. Quite a lot of cinemas, some art centres that have uh, a drop-down screen and, you know, become cinemas. And it's, it's going to be, I'm just so looking forward to showing the same piece of work in a different environment every night. And I know the reaction's just going to be subtly different every time. And then I'm doing a and a at the end of the, the screening and the questions will be different. And it, it is like a gig. Mm. Um, and it's wonderful to see certain scenes uh, going down well. Uh, you know, the, it, a little bit of a tearjerker at times, I like to think. Um, no, without a doubt. No, it really, it really touched mm. me. You know, it's like I'm... I'm someone that I live, I live hundreds of miles away from my parents. So you kind of, it's hard not to think about your own when you're watching the film. Mm. And your kids as well. It's uh, one of the, when I see my son uh, paddling away in the kayak um, and I say, don't go too far. That just chokes me up because I quite, don't quite know why. It's, it's, um, it's, it's just that thing of um, the parental connection um, and, just how much we care about our kids. And uh, it's about life, isn't it? It's about time passing. And we just have to remember that the, um, yeah, it takes us away from caring about the world, which seems a little bit dull and boring and facts and figures. But what I would say to, to audiences now, after the Q&A is, look, just do what you can, you know, uh, with recycling and uh, maybe turn down your thermostat a couple of degrees. Um, don't leave your car engine idling in the car park, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I remember, I remember, um, oh, I, forgot his, I forgot the actor's name now, but he used to, he's, he's an actor who used to be in Brookside, Liverpool, and he, he very much turned his life around and became sort of a, and this is like early 90s, he was sort of into recycling and, and, and sort of environmentally, being environmentally friendly. And he said, it's not about the overwhelming sense of it. It's about choosing one thing at a time that you can change because um, that becomes habit forming. If you think you've got to save the world tomorrow, you'll never do it kind of thing. But Yeah, it's overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, I, I think if you find yourself interested in a particular area of conservation, then do it. I mean, I as I show in the film, I'm quite interested in saving water. Hmm. And um, one thing that I film myself doing, because I, I kind of realise it'd be quite amusing, um, is film myself washing my clothes in the shower by walking up and down on, on them, sort of, yeah. <laughs> you know, the equivalent of uh, peasant villagers washing them on rocks, you know. But I'm just, I have a shower and I wash my hair and all the soap goes down onto the clothes and I'm walking up and down, thereby getting exercise. As I say on the radio, because I've got my email uh, read out by Winifred Robinson on of course, uh, yes. Radio 4. <laughs> so, but the thing is, I'm still doing that now, um, you know, because I quite enjoy it. <laughs> Only Not all the time, just now and again, I just think. What was, yeah, talk, oh. going back to that 100 hours of foot, 100 hours plus of footage you had, What what do you remember being the sort of, and because and you got that down to a to a really sharp eighty three minute film, so there's a lot of there's a lot of choices you're making, and presumably a lot of difficult choices you're making. 
What do you remember being the sort of main storytelling challenges for your documentary? Because obviously you you you, you set off with one idea, but obviously part of what you must have had was discovering what the story was. Yeah, I mean, I I carve out a story through instinct, really, and through experience of having. It's the same when I do a Shuttleworth radio show. You know, I, you just know you have to leave a scene at a certain point with an audience thinking, oh, you know, you, and and a lot of it comes just through editing, as you know. You just uh, you, you you leave a scene a little bit long, and then you leave it for a while, and then you go back and watch it, and you go, oh no that's where I need to cut 10 seconds earlier, you know, when he turns and looks to the door. So a lot of it is that, but then there'll there'll have been bits in there that just weren't working. Um, I can't remember now, but the story bit is, is hot. Yeah. The the sort of getting the dramatic shifts are are the hardest bit, especially with a story that wasn't written. Mm. Stories. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. so I, you, what you do there is just slightly push uh, aspects of, say, for instance, me not seeing my son. Uh, I was seeing him, but it was get quite difficult to have access for a while. So I just kind of push that to make it make the audience think that oh, he's not seeing his son, or you know, there's, something's happened which is bad. Um, just to leave, create a bit of dramatic tension. The same, the same with when things were going wrong with my, my water. Uh, in sorry, that sounds the, the water <laughs> capture. I do this no. rainwater <laughs> capture uh, in in Orkney, which is something I was trying to make the the church totally self sufficient in water. Now it took about a year for it all to. It just sort of fizzled out, and I ended up getting a borehole put in. But I needed some shots to show that it was all going wrong and I didn't really have them. So I just really struggled to piece to get to so any shots that I could find where I was just trying to make the water system better. I kind of put into that section mm. and I, and I added howling wind and stuff, you know, it's, it, you just accentuate. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Make, to, but but just the, but the mammoth task of, to, of taking hundred hours though, and making that into something you can begin to well shape and sculpt what? and finesse. Stuart, Stuart, I didn't count, didn't count the hundred hours. It might only been 50. <laughs> I honestly didn't. I'm, I'm guessing it was. No, but even, hours, even but... 50 hours is a lot more than 83 minutes is all I mean. It's like making sense oh, of yeah. that, making sense of all that footage. I mean, and when you see the film, you know, for people who, who are listening that haven't, it's sort of, you know, there's lots of intimate, nice moments with you and your father in the car. Now, I imagine you had lots of very similar shots because you were on a long car journey. So, which one is the best one? Which is not? Which is not working? Which one su- services yeah. the film best? Those kind of decisions, really. Well, that's right. You have to watch them all, and um, and then you put them into a folder. The ones you want to keep, and you reject the ones that you don't. But I mean, there's a, there's a shot that uh, just springs to mind now of, of my dad that I wasn't going to use because it looks like he's about to die. <laughs> Do you right. know which one I mean? Where he's in the car. I'd actually, that's on a flip camera, which was stuck to the windscreen with gaffer tape and just capturing us as we were driving and chatting. But I'd popped into a shop in Orkney and uh, he was on his own for about five minutes. And he actually um, starts to just have slight breathing difficulties, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, and and but he sort of his head slumps and his eyes, he, and he starts to fall asleep actually. But it looks like he's about to pop his clogs. And um, now perhaps um, you could argue he shouldn't really use a bit of footage like that because. But what happened? What redeems it is that he suddenly opens his eyes, wakes up, and has a cup of a sip of coffee, mm. and so it becomes quite a. Uh, it's, which is quite shocking in a way because uh, anyway I suddenly thought yes I could use that that sequence into into cut with like him him having flashbacks of his life and and also use it as a kind of metaphor for the state of the earth where he becomes he becomes Mother Earth who's in a very dreadful state about to die and then at the last minute recovers so that is my kind of positive optimistic message saying if we do the right things then 
Mother Earth will recover and take a sip of coffee. And so all let's will hope be right. She, let's hope she does. So <laughs> Father Father Earth is you're going to be touring it from you're touring it now and you're going to be touring it till when? Well, at the moment, uh, till December the 9th, I think, um, in London. Uh, but the, but all the dates, can I say the website, Stuart? Yeah, well, I'll put a link in the show notes, to be honest with you, but you can do. Yeah, but, you know, there may be blind listeners who... No, no, please do, tell us. Can only hear? Yeah. Um, or people, yeah. Anyway, it's um, fatheretmovie.com, and all the dates are there. And we're adding new dates uh, as well. And I'll be, I'll be. Um, there's a, there are a few blogs and stuff as well, which I keep meaning to update. But I'll, I'll, I'm coming with the film. I'm travelling with the film, and I'm doing a Q and A afterwards. And uh, yeah, so please come along. I'm, I'm uh, jetting off up to Orkney actually next week via Chorley, Kendall, weird places like Hoyk, Fort William, Inverness, and then. I spent, I'm having a couple of weeks in Orkney and then I'm coming back down uh, Whitley Bay and anyway, lots of other places. Well, cool. Well, look, thanks for giving us the website. I'll put a link in the show notes. It just gives me to say thank you very much to give you time on the Britflix podcast. You're welcome. Thanks, Stuart. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Sure, we have 30 seconds to tell you that drivers who switch to Progressive could save big. But then what? Well, radio has been called theater of the mind. So let's tell a story with sound effects. (laughs) Wow, it's like I was in the story. Almost makes me forget this was supposed to be about saving big with Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.